Monday, April 18th. The Batman is now out on HBO Max everywhere. I've given the movie a shakedown and I've managed to unearth every single hidden detail, Easter egg, and thing that you missed in the film. They think I'm hiding in the spoilers. I am the spoilers. And that's why I'm giving you your last chance to make like Gil Coulson and head off before we ruin the movie. If you enjoy the breakdown then please hit the thumbs up button and also don't forget to subscribe for videos like this every day. Without the way, thank you for clicking the video. I'm Vengeance, now let's get into the breakdown. Okay, so the movie sees Batman facing off against the Riddler who pulls heavily from a lot of serial killers in both real life and fiction. This includes eyewitness sketches of the Zodiac Killer who appeared very similar to his design. Much like the Riddler, Zodiac had his own symbol and he used to taunt the police and media with ciphers that detailed his crimes. Beyond this, there's also a lot of horror icons that influenced the film. We open with Riddler watching the mayor's son and this first person view was also used in the opening of Halloween. When he later kills Gil Coulson, the framing of this whole scene is also extremely in line with the core murder that Michael Meyer does in his first film. Matt Reeves also stated that he took a lot of inspiration from the opening scene of the conversation which featured a voyeur stalking people through binoculars. Silence of the Lambs also makes a big impact. When Batman goes to Arkham, we see that the shots are set up in a very similar way to what happens when Clarice meets Hannibal Lecter for the first time. When Batman first enters the mayor's home, the police also stare at him in a way that they did to Clarice when she surveyed the crime scene in that film. Now I might not look that intimidating yeah, fair enough, but the way that Batman is presented in the film is very much like a horror villain. He operates similar to characters like Jason Voorhees and like them he tends to walk slowly towards his prey as an intimidation tactic to let them know there's no escape. Both the Riddler and Batman first appear from the shadows and the pair are meant to mirror each other throughout the whole movie. Their costumes have similar nose pieces, they of course wear masks, they also keep diaries and both spy on people using binoculars. Now, though he's a far cry from the clownish Riddler that we've seen in films like Batman Forever, there is actually a nod to that film. Riddler wears clear frame glasses over his mask and these look exactly the same as the ones that Jim Carrey wore in that film. He very much riffs on Batman Earth 1 Volume 2 in which he was a terrorist that placed explosives around the city. Riddler would challenge the police and Batman to solve his puzzles within a certain time limit and if they didn't manage to, he'd detonate his traps. Now though we, now though we, should I put on the voice, I'll not bother putting on the voice. <laughs> now though we encounter Riddler in the mayor's home in the opening scene of the film, there's actually a split second shot where you can catch him just before this all begins. Through his eyes we watch as he surveys the home and when he looks up to the roof, if you pause the footage and zoom in, you can catch him in the reflection of the glass. Really creepy detail and there's actually another moment where you can catch him hidden in a scene. At one point we cut to a wide shot of the iceberg lounge and if you look in the top left hand corner, you can catch Edward sitting in his room taking photos. Had Batman thought about where these photographs were taken from, he could have caught the character early and we would have had about a 5 minute long film. Yay, ruining movies! Other moments in the scene that are important to look out for is the DA's SUV, which we can see down the road just behind Selina. Nashin would have seen this several times and he'd know that Coulson often parked there and that it was a position he'd be able to strike him from. He ends up strapping an explosive collar to his neck and this actually pulls from a real life bank robbery that was documented in the Netflix film Evil Genius. Now other cool details in the film are that we of course meet his helper at the mayor's funeral and he's the person that later on announces that he's vengeance. Shortly after this, Gil Coulson is sent in and his license plate reads S397WD which is a reference to Detective Comics 27 released all the way back in 1939. Many of the officers in the movie are from the 39th precinct as well and like Batman says, It's all connected. Been waiting to use that. Now during the live stream there's also a comment that says hope it's a dud and we gotta do it all again Tuesday which sets up the attack that comes at the end of the movie. With the first killing happening on October 31st, we can work out that the final one takes place on November 5th which is likely a reference to Bonfire Night. On the 5th of November 1605, Guy Fawkes took part in the gunpowder plot in which he attempted to blow up Parliament. Had it succeeded this would have completely destabilised the British government more than Partygate. I think Reeves is very much giving a nod to that with the date. The live stream also has some really nice puns in it, such as a user saying mind blowing stuff and this is gonna be such a blast. <laughs> now much like me, Batman doesn't really pay attention to the normal side of his life. He dresses a bit like a freak sometimes which, yeah kinda fair, but had he paid attention to the Bruce Wayne side of his life, he would have unearthed the renewal project much much earlier. Alfred tells him that it won't be long before he goes bust and thus he calls in the accountants. Bruce doesn't really seem to care about this meeting but had he paid attention to these books, he would have of course unearthed the corruption within it. That's why I make a better Batman. Now truth be told, I love this detail and it's something that's popped up in a lot of early Batman stories. 
Both Batman Earth 1 and Zero Year had him completely ignoring the Bruce Wayne persona because he didn't see it as being useful. However, at the end of the comics he embraced it because he realised it gave him another avenue into Gotham into which he could take down the corrupt elite. Batman slowly works his way up through the ranks in the film and we watch as he starts off with low-level thugs, moves up to gangsters, takes down the person that runs the entire city and then stops the supervillain. Nice form of growth there throughout and what's... What's this? What's what's this? Riddle me this, spoiler man. What does every heavy spoilers video have in it that makes it awful? A Paul N. <laughs> oh, I just screen crushed that right there. Damn it, Riddler! I'll get you! Also in Wayne Manor, we can catch that he has an electric guitar and an amp, which was difficult to spot first watch because this column was in the way. Yeah. Mmm. Now, Selena also plays a big part in the film. There's a really subtle thing that they do with her that actually shows when she really likes someone and when it's just an act. Initially, she calls Annika baby, and this is because she cares about her a lot. Throughout the rest of the film, she calls everyone else honey. This even happens to Bruce, however, after they kiss, she finally calls him baby. Now, the film culminates with the seawall of Gotham being destroyed. This heavily pulls from books like Zero Year, which featured the Riddler taking over Gotham after he flooded the city. However, the Riddler's plan in the film is also heavily in line with the Jokers in the graphic novel The Man Who Laughs, in that the Clown Prince of Crime kills several high-ranking politicians, and he even makes an attempt on Bruce Wayne's life like what we have here. Come the end of the work, Bruce discovers the Joker's plan to use the reservoir to take down the city, much in the same way that the Riddler does here. Now, the seawall being destroyed is pretty much how the movie culminates, and we actually get a big hint towards it early on in the film. During the debate with Bella Real, the mayor says she wants to gut the Renewal Project Fund, which will mean that vital seawall funds are also cut. My opponent here wants to gut the Gotham Renewal Program, established by the great Thomas Wayne. Cutting funds for vital projects like our seawall and the safety net for those who need The renewal program is broken. Beyond this though, we can catch a newspaper wall chronicling Don's wins, and if you zoom in on the one below the Ellen lies, you can catch a mention of this. It asks whether the seawall construction has been stalled, and due to the greed of the corrupting Gotham, it's turned it into a weak point that the Riddler exploits. Now the movie opens with the title card in big red writing, and though this is completely disconnected from Joaquin Phoenix's film, that too did something similar. I love this style for movies that aren't part of the DCEU, and if you ask me, might be better just doing these standalone films, Warner Brothers. Y your universe is a bit of a mess, let's be honest. Now, the artwork used for the film, namely its posters and banners, all heavily use black and red imagery, which feels like it's based on the book Dark Victory. Over the weekend, I also started binging through Batman the Animated Series, and upon opening up the box set, I immediately recognised the title card of that being in line with the movie too. Riddler catches the mayor's son in a ninja costume for Halloween, and there are teases that he could end up being a Robin. He's wearing red, practising martial arts, and he also finds his father dead. Kid is clearly going to be traumatised, yay, and guess what? You're Robin now, you punk. Get in the costume, chump, and don't make me tell you again. Now inside the mayor's home, we see a headline detailing Maroney's capture, and in case you don't know, he's a gangster from the comics that ended up throwing acid in Harvey Dent's face. This happened during the long Halloween, which this movie is heavily based upon. In it, a killer known as Holiday strikes mobsters on every holiday, and he leaves clues behind at the scene of the crime. These attacks completely terrify Gotham, and Batman, Harvey Dent and Gordon end up working together in this year two story. Now it even has a section where Catwoman goes off in her own, and this expands into the graphic novel Catwoman When in Rome. In this, she attempts to unearth whether Falcon is her father or not, but in this film, we already get it confirmed. Now there's even a section that's ripped directly from that book, and when Falcon talks about Thomas Wayne saving its life, it's pulled from those pages. He was shot several times, put on a table and operated on, whilst Bruce sat looking down on him. This is very much mirrored in Falcon's death later on, and when he's shot, he lays on his back looking up at Bruce. What the? What the hell was that? Hope you've been watching this video legally. Anyway, after the Riddler's attack, we cut to the bat signal lighting up, and they use colour brilliantly here, as we start with green, which is linked to the Riddler. Now, he's very much infecting the idea of what it means to be Batman, or rather vengeance, and it's very subtle having his colour be the thing that's slowly breaking across the light that shines above the city. And what a city it is. In our first wide shot, we see the Gotham Empire and the Odyssey, which may be a nod of the book of the same name by Neil Adams. There's also the Bank of Gotham and a Little Caesars advert. They ran a promotion alongside the movie with a Batman pizza that looked, it looked like ass to be fair. Now there's also signs up that say drops and these appear on the train too. 
Though we don't learn exactly what they are, it's likely that they're linked to either the Joker or potentially Scarecrow. The former was core before this movie began, and it could tie in with his origin story at Ace Chemicals. Now over the top of this scene, we hear Bruce's chilling narration. They think I'm hiding in the shadows, but I am the shadows. We later learn this is part of a journal entry, and this somewhat riffs on year one, in which his narration was presented in the form of notepads. This scene pulls heavily from Bruce's first night going downtown, in which he dressed up as a drifter and walked into the centre of Gotham looking to stop crime. Several of the same shots and angles are used, and interestingly, everyone around Bruce is in a costume. However, he's in what would be classed as normal clothes, but this is actually a disguise that he uses in order to blend in. So he's wearing a mask much like those around him. It seems like it's always raining in Gotham, and I think by the bat signal and final scene, it pretty much is. Reeves said he did this intentionally in order to add to the detective noir feeling of the film. This was beautifully carried out in Blade Runner, and Matt wanted Gotham to feel harsh and relentless, almost like it's beating down on you constantly in every single aspect. Now we cut to several crimes across the city, including the Good Times grocery store robbery. Reeves said that he chose to cast Pattinson because of the film Good Times, which this is clearly a nod to. Going beyond that, the drophead also wears the exact same clothes that Pattinson had on in that movie, and as I say, it's all connected. Now there are also vandals messing up the bank of Gotham. It is possible that one of these is Anarchy, a low-level Batman villain that uses Molotov cocktails, and also spray paint in order to send his message. However, who Batman is after is the black and white gang that appears to be based on Penguin's goons from the comics and games. He made his forces wear the colours black and white just like a penguin, and this design featured heavily in Arkham City. They are trialling a new member who only has half of his face painted, showing that he's not yet fully part of the gang. This actor plays Robin on Titans, and I did kind of get the feeling that they were maybe trying to show he was influenced by Batman, so this could lead into something like the Sons of Batman from The Dark Knight Returns. Batman stops them, and they very much represent random acts of violence that have no meaning, much like what took his parents. Now it's at this point that he introduces himself. I am Wade. No, no. I'm Vengeance. This is a direct nod to Batman Earth 1, when the Cape Crusader introduced himself as that to the Penguin. During the fight, Batman busts out a shocking attack, which we know from the book and the film is his taser glove. There was a similar power up in Arkham Origins, which might be a reach. Now speaking of Arkham Origins, the Batsuit feels like it's based on elements of that, however it also brings in certain aspects of the suit from other iterations. The cow looks extremely similar to the one from Gotham by Gaslight, and this also had a collar. This appeared in Batman White Knight, and the darts on the wrist are also something that the Talons used in the New 52. These were used as assassins by the Court of Owls, and we also get a potential nod to these in the first clue, which has an owl on the front of the card. Batman walks through the scene with a strong focus on his feet, painting him out like he's almost a character in a western movie, which is later mirrored at the end of the car scene. Now it's... Hold on. What's this? What's this? Riddle me this. What do Paul's wife and his subscribers both say about him? He finishes quickly. <laughs> God damn it, Riddler! Now it's at this point we meet Commissioner Pete Savage, played by the savage Trevor from EastEnders. In the comics, it was Commissioner Loeb who was murdered in the book Dark Victory, and they might have changed it up because Loeb was the Commissioner and Batman Begins. Throughout, Batman very much disregards the Bruce Wayne side of his life, and he rides around the city on a motorbike. I feel the movie very much also pulls from elements of Batman Year 100. This is a great graphic novel set in the future in which Batman rides around Gotham on the back of a custom motorbike. He's very much a mechanic that also uses horror motifs from the movies to scare his prey, much like what Pattinson's version does. Now Batman returns to his base of operations called Wayne Terminus. This is revealed to be a disused train station created by the Waynes, similar to the monorail that they built in Batman Begins. Having a train line under the city would allow Batman to travel under it without going under the surface, and it's a strategy that he's also used in the comics. During the Nightfall arc, John Paul Valley, who took over the cowl, fitted his Batmobile with wheels that could run on train tracks, and he constantly rode around on them under the city. Bruce mounts a bike similar to the one that he had in Zero Year, and he rides past Gotham Square Garden, which has Bella Real adverts up at it. This is where the final battle takes place, and we can see it showcasing the upcoming election night. Bruce passes by here later on when he's following Selina from her apartment, and it slowly teases this as a major location. We catch my boy has an emo haircut, and though this gets memed on a lot, I actually think there's a specific reason for it. In the New 52, Bruce shaved his head so it was one thing he didn't have to worry about, and maybe he grew it long because he doesn't care about his appearance or have time to cut it. Bruce plays back the night, and he then jots down the narration that we've just heard. At one point we can see his contact lens also creates a transcript, so that Batsy never misses a trick. 
Bruce ends up looking over his shoulder to the news announcement and this shot is later mirrored in the reveal of the Riddler, hitting to us at how the two are linked. As Alfred descends, we can catch the Batmobile engine and the car itself sit under a top. We get shots of this lace throughout the cave at several points in the movie and it very much hints at its reveal. Alfred looks over the video of the child and clearly this reminds him of a young Bruce who he feels like he failed. Now we get Bruce coming out of the shower and can see that he's got a heavily scarred back. This is a nod to the Alex Ross piece of art which also had similar cuts on it. I love the camera work here and throughout the film there's several scenes where we follow characters from behind such as Gordon, Selina and of course Bruce. Lots of feelings like we are voyeurs ourselves and it very much adds to moments like this. Now Bruce has very much become a nocturnal animal and upon seeing the sun for the first time he has to cover his eyes with sunglasses. At this point we meet Dory who I kind of feel like might be a nod to Aunt Harriet from the 1966 Batman show. We get a much clearer easter egg that pulls from this later on when we catch the Shakespeare bust next to Alfred. This was a big part of the show and I love how Reeves included it. After cracking the cipher they head to the mayor's garage which is filled with expensive cars. Gordon says I guess it's good to be the mayor and clearly he could only afford these if someone was lining his pockets. Now during his search Batman busts out a tube light which he carried in the new 52 and also Earth 1. In the tire of an Aston Martin they find the weapon used to sever the mayor's thumb and a thumb drive with his thumb attached to it. <laughs> thumb drive. <laughs> Should have turned off Wi-Fi though because activating it sends out emails to everyone including the Gotham Gazette, a newspaper that's popped up in the animated series, in the new 52, Black Case book and a lot more. We get a split second shot of Gordon's inbox and this contains several bureau memos that are repeated. However there's also the case file 0281 which might be a nod to Batman 281 titled Murder Comes in Black Boxes. Annika very much feels like she's based on Holly Robinson, a character from year one that Catwoman lived with. Later on in the Batmobile chase we get a sign for Robinson Park which also happens to be a location in Gotham based on her. Batman then arrives at the Iceberg Lounge which is the base of operations for the Penguin in the comics. This scene pretty much happens three times in the movie with him first going as Batman, then Bruce and then he sneaks in later having formulated the best strategy to get in there without getting caught. The twins also feel like they're based on the villains Tweedledee and Tweedledum which my surname's Tweddle yet, yeah, I've just had twins, they're gonna get called that and I'm, I'm bloody, I'm fuming I tell you. Now Batman then goes in the club and I kinda wanted him to bust out dad's moves. Come on, do the bat dance. Come on. Also, look at these Funko Pops, yeah? God damn. Now, Penguin clearly isn't intimidated by him as he calls him sweetheart, but come the car chase, he's terrified. It's clear Oz is just a lowly worker that no one really respects, and Batman mocks his reputation, which I find hilarious. Batman follows Catwoman back to her apartment, and he ends up spying on her, much in the same way they looked over Andrea in Mask of the Phantasm. Andrea. He follows her to the mayor's office and body pops his grappling gun like it's a star of Smooth Criminal. Ow! Also, notice how Bruce drops the Batman voice when talking to her as opposed to how he interrogates the Penguin. Now, Selina attempts to get Annika's passport back in a scene that's somewhat riffing on the long Halloween. In that, Selina went to Falcone's apartment to crack his safe and Batman confronted her there before grabbing a ledger full of the mob boss's dealings. They then return to Selina's apartment and in the comics, this was where they originally met. Now the movie is filled with these news reports that somewhat riff on Batman 89 and also The Dark Knight Returns. In those they were used to pretty much tell us the story as well as the opinions of the public on Batman. After Pete Savage is killed we get our second clue which has an old man on the front and then an explosion inside of the card. This might be foreshadowing the explosion that happens later with Alfred as the following clue has a woman answering the phone much like what happens with Dory. On her way to the clubception club within a club she comes across William Kenzie a character from the comics that was also a GCPD officer. In the basement she meets DA Gil Coulson, possibly riffing on Gilda, Harvey Dent's wife, who was of course a DA in The Long Halloween. There's also Carla, possibly a nod to Carla Vidi, who also featured in that book. I jump to the bat signal scene and we get a hint at Renewal on one of the billboards, which is then shown when Gordon pulls up. Renewal is purposely laced throughout every aspect of the city and it shows how wide it stretches. It even shows up on the back of a garbage truck because like you, it's trash. Now beside the signal we see the WGOT radio tower. This was a radio station in the comics that Jack Ryder reported for. We then get the next clue. This has a UR so URL and they mess up the translation. I cut to the funeral and the external shots were heavily shown online by people that went to watch these scenes being filmed. Reeves wanted to keep Barry Keoghan's role of the Joker so secret that he actually filmed fake scenes with him in which he seemed like a policeman. There were also several shots with Zoe Kravitz and John Turturro that made it seem like they had a relationship. 
Now, I kind of hope that Irving and Severance is actually his innie, and this is his outie, but that's a crap little theory I have. Go check out our Severance video though, it's really good. Now, Bruce rides in a Corvette, which was also used in the 1970s as a basis for the Batmobile. Huge shout out to the Canadian lab for that one, and go check out his breakdown as well. Now, the explosion by Riddler is a big talking point around the movie as it blasts Batman in the face, and he still comes out looking like Robert Pattinson. His mouth isn't even burned, and it does seem a bit unrealistic. However, if you slow down the footage, yes, yeah, slow it down. Well, well, we'll do it for you. Slow down the footage, and you can actually see him putting his hand over his mouth to cover it just as the bomb goes off. As a disclaimer, yeah, if a dude ever explodes in your face, make sure you cover your mouth. Oh, cut that. Now, the police start to question Batman, and we get this awesome scene. Early on in his career, the police were very much against him, and in both Year One and Mask of the Phantasm, he ended up taking down a whole SWAT team. He ends up gliding off the top of the police department and smacks his face, which is potentially playing on the opening of Earth One. In that, he goes to jump across a building, but he ends up falling after his grappling gun breaks. The penguin scene happens at the docks, and Reeves stated that he took a lot of inspiration for the Batmobile from the John Carpenter classic Christine. You've done a full video on this scene alone, but like Batman, the car comes from the shadows. It also gets covered in fire and chases after someone much like the monstrous machine did in that movie. Reeves stated that he took inspiration from the French Connection and also elements of the Steve McQueen classic Bullet. Along with the Robinson reference, there's also nods to Hinkley River, which is a feature in Gotham. Upon being caught, Penguin waddles like one, which I absolutely love. The scar across his face also gives a beak-like shape to his nose, and I really hope that the makeup artists behind this get an Oscar, because Colin Farrell looks absolutely unrecognisable. Now, after tracking Riddler to an orphanage, both Batman and Gordon explore it, much in the same way that the pair went through an abandoned building together at the end of Earth 1. Here they see a campaign video for Thomas Wayne, and in that book, the character was running for mayor, which led to his murder. He also ran for mayor and Joker, but unlike that version of Thomas, this one seems more sincere, even if he does like getting journalists beaten up. Now again, we hear the song Ave Maria, which opens the movie. This is typically used at both funerals and weddings, and it was actually one of John Wayne Gacy's favourite songs, along with Sen in the Clowns. Now this time, it's sang by a children's choir, and we later learn that Edward is a member of this group, explaining why he likes to sing it. Alfred then gets a letter for the Batman, and if I ever get mail that has fireproof on the back, I'm, I'm throwing it away, I don't care who it's from. Now there's a lot of debate over whether Riddler knows Bruce's Batman, or if he doesn't. In the comics, during the Hush storyline, he figured it out, but he decided not to tell anyone because of how worthless a riddle is that everyone knows the answer to. Hush is also referenced in the film during the campaign video, and we see the surname Elliot pop on screen. Thomas Elliot became the villain Hush in the comics, but the animated movie changed things up so that it was actually the Riddler under the mask. Now, potentially, the Riddler is the journalist kid, though we never get this confirmed. Now, a clue that Riddler might know is that Bruce is the only target he doesn't try to kill himself. Therefore, it might be because he wanted him to survive, but hey, I'll leave that up to you to debate in the comments. We also learn more about Martha Wayne, who, like Earth-1, is revealed to be an Arkham. Originally, she was called Martha Kane after Bob Kane, but they changed it up to kind of give Bruce the feeling that insanity runs in his family. Now, the Wayne cease and desist letter demand is sent by the law firm Miller & Moore, which are nods to Frank Miller and Alan Moore, two seminal Batman writers. Batman goes to Falcone, who we get hints towards murdering Thomas. This is a slight change up from Earth-1, in which it was suspected that Penguin did it so that he could become mayor. Revealed to be the rat with wings, all eyes then turn to him. Now, in every other iteration, he's called Falcone, but I think they changed it up to this to do the little falcon bird pun. Now, what the, hell, what the hell is this? Riddle me this. What happens when your spoilers are too heavy for your TV? Your screen gets crushed, and you suck at breakdown videos. Quit while you still can. Screen crush, God damn it! I knew it was you, you punk! <laughs> oh, I'm wearing a shirt on my face! <laughs> Dickhead. You got a little dick and your kids are actually mine. Now we're at the final hour mark of the movie, and Selina ends up scratching Falcone's face, and this is exactly the same as how she did in Year One. Bruce ends up leading Falcone into the light, which makes the Riddler believe that he's an accomplice and an ally in on his plan. They catch him at a diner that pops up throughout the film, and the look of this scene is based heavily on Nighthawks by Edward Hopper. Riddler's head gets smashed against the counter like you should smash that like button, and this cracks his glasses. I love how this detail remains on them for the rest of the film, and you can catch it in the Arkham interrogation. He also carries two IDs, 
Edward Nashton and Patrick Parker, which are both aliases that he's used in the comics. However, we still don't have his true name, which is Edward Nigma or Mr. Enigma. Now inside the apartment, we catch a single bat in a cage with rats scurrying below it, which represents Batman hanging above the city whilst the rats act below him. Riddler's final plan is located under his carpet, but because Bruce comes from a privileged background, he doesn't recognize the working class carpet tool. He goes to visit Riddler and Arkham, and we know from the deleted scenes that something similar happened with the Joker due to the one that was recently posted. In this, Batman handed over evidence with a paperclip on it, and this later disappeared because the clown prince of crime likely pocketed it. Whether this will lead to his escape, we don't know, but the pair do form a friendship come the end of the movie. Now, this could potentially set up a War of Jokes and Riddles sequel, which turned Gotham into a war zone. There's also heavy allusions to No Man's Land from the comics. Gotham was rocked by an earthquake in the book Cataclysm, and after the government abandoned the city, it turned into a wasteland with every criminal vying for control. Covered in The Dark Knight Rises, it seems like they're setting up things with Belle Real, potentially reaching out to Bruce so that he can help save things. In the comics, he ended up travelling to the Senate to beg for help, and this could be what makes him realise he needs to pay more attention to this side of his life. Batman ends up taking down the Riddler's forces, and though I was hoping that it would be Venom that he uses, the official book released alongside the film does say that it's adrenaline. There's also a scene where he moves out of the way of someone shooting him, and though there were a lot of complaints on Twitter that he just let this guy die, if you slow down the footage, you'll see the bullet actually hits his gauntlet and head, which then causes a ricochet. He also ends up clouding the whole area in smoke, which is reminiscent of the scene from The Dark Knight Returns, in which he did the same thing when fighting Two-Face's forces. Now through the goon, he realises Batman must very much become a symbol of hope, and he goes through somewhat of a baptism. Emerging as a new kind of hero, he's now seen as someone that people shouldn't cower away from, and this is symbolised by the girl on the roof. The man at the train station at the start was terrified of him, whereas she refuses to let go, showing how his arc has gone from being about vengeance to something more important. Flooded locations lit at the finale, including City Hall, the diner, the Iceberg Lounge, and we catch Penguin staring over the city. We know that he's getting a spin-off show very soon, and he will try and grab everything that he can in his quest for power. Catwoman says that Batman's spoken for, and this is a line that ended Batman Zero Year. She also states that she's going to Bloodhaven, which is a sister city to Gotham in the comics, that's a horn of Nightwing. Batman rides off beside Selina, and then watches her disappear in the rearview mirror before turning his eyes to the road. He'd love to go with her, but Gotham is where his heart is at, and I love how this shot is used to convey that emotion. Come the end of his arc, I'd love to see Bruce deciding to ride off with her and getting a sort of similar scene, but sadly, I can't watch this scene without seeing this. Anyway, thank you for sitting until the end of the video. I had to record this twice because my camera broke. Um, I'm absolutely sweating. I'm drenched. You can probably tell just by looking at me. I look a mess. So a thumbs up is massively appreciated. Also, f*** binary and I'll see you on the next one. Take care. Peace.